basically, uh, we're at the home of Steve Reese yeah. on Sulphur Mountain Road, and uh, Steve is going to talk to us a little while here about his early experiences in water and uh, how he first got interested in it and some of the experiences he had to um, indicate that perhaps there were other sources of water than most people can really yeah, think of. Proof to me that uh, I was about 14, 14 years old, so between 1912 and 1914 in Switzerland where I went to school. My parents were living there and uh, a neighbor home close by up down the street was the home of Dr. Birkenbach. Ber Birkenbach? Yeah, professor of chemistry who uh, uh, was a, a nature lover, you might call it. Whenever he had a weekend to spare, three, four days, he used to get the bedrolls together and the two boys of his, one of them a year younger and the other two year older than I, went with him on a, on a trip, mostly down the River Moselle, or the River Rhine, or the River Danube, or the River Neckar, on which the old uh, castles were built, mm -hmm. especially on the Rhine, which where the major castles there, the huge ones like Remagen and such places, that were built by Charlemagne. And the record on Remagen there says that they begin to level the hilltop off, impenetrable mountain peaks. Salt, solid rock. All solid granite. That they leveled them off then, and after that, uh, they drilled a hole, which they called uh, a Brunnen, which is a well. And <coughs> That well went down, in this particular case, around 300 meters, which is roughly 900 feet. But the river below was still more than 1,000 feet lower than the bottom of that well. Okay. The elevation. Right, right. And the River Rhine, you know, is a constant flowing stream, and uh, the water, if that was water from Inseep, be a little hard to percolate out. It, it would have had to go and drain off into the Rhine. Yeah. It was the reverse. The water rose to within about 40 feet from the yeah, surface of the hole. <laughs> See? And the funny part of it is, 900 years later, when I saw it first, it was still there. Unusable. The water level was still yeah. at that level. And still usable good water. Well, the reason they built those castles in those days when he was so called the ruler of all of the countries, uh, that was his military power. Sure. He had usually two to three hundred cavalry people, horses, and their women and children, and they had chicken and hogs. And and milk cows, and of course a large amount of beans, lentils. Thanks, Thelma. Lentils stored, such type of food, you know, wheat, which they then could grind up and start using. So uh, <coughs> we used to visit those castles to camp a night or two, mm -hmm. bedroll stuff. And he used to tell us that he is so disgusted with the teaching of science that uh, he's quit for that reason, you know. And uh, he explained to us that the idea of water that also had been questioned already way back by Galileo and others, and way back by Pliny in the year 17 AD, does not, the water does not originate in the atmosphere and up and high. It couldn't. There is no oxygen, no atmosphere, no nothing. And the water could not remain there or be such. That all the water on this planet is a product of the interior. 
He also had been then convinced and was maybe one of the first one talking about the water destruction by photosynthesis, which means the growing of plant life and forests and trees, whatever green. And without that, there could be no life on the planet. Impossible. And the amount that now that has been estimated the last five years or more, the last reports that came out after a 40 year study by European and American scientific organizations and universities, the report is that we are losing 600 million gallons of water daily by photosynthesis, or there would be no plant life. Just in the breakdown of the hydrogen and oxygen. Naturally. <coughs> the oxygen is liberated. Like we, like we inhale it, the plant exhales what we inhale. Right. I mean, what we exhale. Right. And we, we it, inhale what it exhales. What it produces, which right. is the oxygen. Right. So consequently, that volume of water, such enormous amount of water, is the equivalent of every gallon of water would have been consumed in less than three million years. There'd be no water in the ocean. However, since tertiary, the oceans have risen one-third of our total capacity, which we are also sure of, and it's still rising. So consequently, it's logic in many other respects, in mineralogy, crystallography, that water can only come from the Earth itself, not from outer space. And this is actually a water planet. There's no question about that. Uh, the latest informations are startling. The Russians now have drilled for almost 12 years constantly and have managed to reach 40,000 feet at this time. Mm -hmm. Have you read about yes, the I deal? Well, I got the last report yesterday. Of, and some. They have now found out that they are drilling at 400 degree temperature mm -hmm. on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And incredible pressures. Yeah, but water not steam at 400 degrees. In other words, they have no atmosphere, so the water can't steam. Hmm. See? And then they had about 500, 600 feet above it, or 1,000 feet higher up. <coughs> they had 20. <coughs> 20 degrees temperature there, and plenty of water, <coughs> not freezing, when it should have been frozen. Right. Now they are in 400 degrees, and it's water and not steam. They also so, have found out that they couldn't get any more rock samples from the drilling. Because of the temperature? No. They blow apart into dust before oh, they came sure. up. Because of the de decreased pressure as it yeah. goes up. So there are so many points that they begin to learn and learn, and it's a good thing the Russians are doing that. The whole world will benefit greatly yeah. from it. Uh, three or four top men from our country were over there and were permitted to see the whole world and observe everything. So we have been a bunch of foods, or taken for a bunch of foods, by believing that humbug that they've been preaching and are preaching right now in the university. About the water cycle. About water, the origin of water, and what it is. It's ridiculous. Uh, that professor, Birkenbach, told me and his two boys that they are absolutely nuts. It's all humbug. He saw through it. See? And I remember at that time, the first time, I must have been about 14, 15 years old, when I read the report from Pliny, 17 AD. <laughs> and he wrote it out. Yeah. Then Galileo came along, and the Pope told him to reverse it, or else they could burn him on the stake. Right. And then, so anyhow, so Pliny, was writing about this way back in the... In the year 17 A.D. Way back, isn't it? Yes. Okay. He assumed that it is such and such, but 
he did mention that they come out of the fire of the interior. Mm -hmm. The waters are the result from the fires in the interior. He, he said the results of the fire, okay, so as, in other words, as a magnet yeah, cool, steaming, crystallizes. Steaming the water out of the, by heat, from the rocks. Yeah. <coughs> of course, now we know that there were no rocks at that depth. Couldn't exist. Mm -hmm. It'd be a muddy state. A muddy, no solid. Right. Uh, in the in the third zone to the interior, the interior five thousand miles across cannot be anything but gas. Mm -hmm. We're aware of that. No solid matter. Mm -hmm. uh, when you take rock today and you get up to five thousand, you have no more left. The gas out. Mm -hmm. It splits, separates, right. and the second zone, before we get to the interior zone, we have 7,000 degrees mm -hmm. temperature. Mm -hmm. Just like the Russians are now running in 400 degrees already. Right. They, and there are 40,000 feet. And the rule is 80 foot deeper, one more degree. Every 80 feet you gain one degree. It don't matter whether you're on the North Pole, you're here or in the tropics. Right. <coughs> <coughs> it's from the pressure. Mm -hmm. So, the funny part of it is that all that fallacy existed for 5,000, 6,000 years now. The mis the, mis uh, the concept. <coughs> but, the earliest civilizations followed a stream, a creek, a spring. And some of the springs are known for the last four and five thousand years. Mm -hmm. You take the spring in uh, Syria, what's the name of the capital there? Damascus. Damascus. A million and a half population and the water surplus. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of the country is totally dry. Yeah. That, was a, that was that spring. Chris wrote about his book, I guess. You what? Chris wrote about Yeah, that he mentioned book. it too. But there are so many others. You take the two big springs in America. Outside of 92 springs, I have the records on them, in the Sierras. Uh, California, uh, Washington, and on up in uh, Canada. They all go over 200 gallons a minute. Many of them five and seven and nine thousand gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. And I was all there all winter long, steaming. If you go up to Mammoth now, on the way to Reno, mm -hmm. you cross Hot Creek. Right. This time of year, you see the steam coming off through the snow. Right. Five thousand gallons a minute. Out of Lake Volcanic up here. Mm -hmm. No inflow possible. None at all. What about our, uh, Lake Tahoe? The same day of story. Right. It's huh? in a big rift valley. Right. Well, you've got the Truckee River and you've got the uh, the other river coming down there, going into what, uh, you know, going, about the heck is the name there? Humboldt? No. The Humboldt comes in too from the north. But these two, these rivers that come out of Tahoe, the uh, Truckee River and the other one. I don't know what the other one is, the Truckee. Baker or something, I don't know. And there's a hell of a lot of water flow. Yeah. In two months, the, the lake be empty if there was no inflow. Yeah. See? But see, that's something that, uh, you know, I don't know, what, what did geologists say about that? I mean, how did they explain that? Ignore it completely. Absolutely. And this is the amazing thing that they are such a bunch of ignoramuses, or hypocrites rather, that they ignore it when they see it. <coughs> we got a spring in Oregon, West Oregon in the, in the desert, that flows the Daly River. Comes out of the ground and on she goes, it's the Daly River. 800 million gallons a day. Enough for a city like Los Angeles. We got one in Missouri, about the same. I don't know which one has a few gallons more or less, mm -hmm. 
constant flow. In Western Oregon certainly doesn't get the rainfall. There is a report now made that if the water of every drop of water that falls on the state of Oregon wouldn't supply that spring's flow a year. Yeah. So it's an amazing situation uh, that literature, scientific literature, schools, teaching can overlook all those facts. Because none of them has the guts to admit it and supposed to explain it. What you going to explain? Huh? So nobody ever did. And I've been running into that constantly all my life long. However, I did know that in mines, in deeper mines, they hit enormous streams of water. You must realize that water is an incompressible compound. It just doesn't compress. If it comes to high pressure testing or proofing, you use hot water. You can't compress it. You can compress a cubic foot of iron somewhat under high pressure, but not water. So if I have a million cubic feet of water flowing a day, which many of the big springs do, I would have a tremendous cavity on the ground where it locked in water, what they call trapped water. And I have uh, repeatedly been told, like in the semi wells, the state of California from the governor's office down kept on insisting that I only have trap water which one morning will quit. Finished. And I had a hundred geologists for a meeting call me in when I made that uh, various statements in magazines and they were getting worried. See, I called them just ignoramuses, see. So, they challenged me, and I was tickled to death to go. And I told him, look here, have you ever recognized the difference between usable, good water, highly mineralized water, or even conate water, brine? And you have the best information by thousands of oil wells you've been drilling. It's always conate water. And do you realize that if you had so many millions of gallons of water in an old prehistoric cavity, uh, empty area, and you pump that water out, that that whole damn surface would go down. What would hold this, this thing up? I pumped a billion gallons in me. And I said, you realize that is the equivalent of the range? Cubic wide. Of the, of the, that, the whole... The whole, the whole the on the mountain would have collapsed. How could it hang in the air? That in, uh, the rock can only stand so much and then she breaks. See? Furthermore, water that is locked up, you can take today the absolutely distilled water lock it up for 10 to 15 years in a cement enclosure. It'll, it'll eat through the cement. And leach the minerals The out. natural law of water is life, absolutely. It's always alive. It never stops disintegrating. That's why we have every metal, every mineral that we know, every substance on this planet in solution in the ocean. That's the only reason because water will dissolve it. The, uh, when you realize how the waters in the past prehistoric channels have taken those enormous caves underground, you know, for miles and miles, big, great big underground openings. Realizing. So I knew as a youngster from the time I was with that professor on the weekend trips that he had something that didn't check with what we were told or thought to be, and it always stuck with me. Right. And I know that that water in those castle uh, wells could not have been surface water going into these hard rocks and stopped somewhere in there in the hole, halfway down to the, to the riverbed. 
the test out of the question. Also, I did know that the spring waters usually were different, and he pointed that out to us all the time, that a real spring water was different in analysis from what you found in the river or what you generally found in a spring, or rather in a well. When you get below the zone of oxidization, which varies, depends on the formation you're in, could be a lot of sand and gravel and porous mud, they go way in the hell deep. But on the other hand, if you get into the crevice stuff, it can't go below the zone of oxidization. And when you're below the zone of oxidization, no metal, no mineral could ever appear in your water. Be because there is no solution or dissolving without oxidization. Right. Clear. And it's about that reason that I am now going, and have done so for a long time, cement off surface waters I don't want and go below it and get my good water below that. That never's been one of the same, never been together. Right. It's the deep waters that come up. And if it wasn't for deep waters, as is positively established now, this planet would be bone dry in three million years or less. There wouldn't be a gallon in the ocean. Because of photosynthesis. Sure, naturally. Yeah, when you realize many of those trees take 50 gallons a day, mm -hmm. Some of those large cottonwoods. <coughs> that they plant along the canals in Arizona along. Two hundred gallons a day. Yeah. They don't realize that the trees take more water than they take for their farming. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, how we can dream along as stupid as possible. <coughs> and I would be still stuck today if it hadn't been for the fact that the lowering of the table is dawning on him mm -hmm. and that the contamination and the poisoning of the waters which are still yeah. around. Yeah. I got a report here, 2200 wells had to be shut down because of poisoning in the state of California. This past year, or this last year, up uh, at this time. At this time, altogether, they had to outlaw them. Wow. So yeah, you know that's information that the public is really not very much aware of either. You know they sort of shut these things down, one here, one there, and uh, most people aren't even aware of the. Well, now we have six wells down in San Diego, big wells, good wells, good water. When they couldn't find anything wrong with the water analysis, this came up with the idea about radioactive. Well, we had to knock that out. And if Maya wasn't high financed very, very clearly, he'd be out of business long ago. He couldn't fight him. And I got now a report from the lawyers that Maya and Shopi and Owen hired. Because Shopi, Maya and, uh, and uh, Owen are going to take the governor and the legislature of California for fraud. They're that should going be to a good one. Huh? That should be interesting. That's going to be interesting. What's that? They wrote a 10 page. I'm going to give you a copy. Yes, I'd like to Did I give you one? No, but you I told get me you about one. It. I'd like to read it. In which they always wind up the lowering of the water table dependent on rainfall, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that means that the Public Utility Commission which is a legal authority in the state, mm -hmm. would have always command of the water. Right. And they govern your price, they take the source, mm -hmm. and they tell you to jump in the lake. Mm -hmm. Even though you spent the money drilling. And it's your well on your land, yeah. or whatever it is. Right. So, <laughs> Meyer, of course, and his lawyers, uh, Shopi and Meyer put up $10,000 for a legal investigation of the laws of the land. Uh -huh. I'll give you a copy. And they always wind up table water. Mm -hmm. Lowering of the table, lowering of the water. Ground, by table water, you mean ground water? Ground water, yeah, table water. Mm -hmm. 
and there is where she winds up. And that is going to knock them out. On the other hand, if we don't do that, we are going to get released. They'll take it over on the basis of ground or table water. You see? Community, public owned, finished. They let us have a few gallons out of the well for the land we have maybe in use. The rest belongs to them, which they clearly say, yeah. under the law of the land. But where we have new water, independent of groundwater, which they cannot trace our source, mm -hmm. to rain or inflow, river sinking or anything, right. they're hooked. Right. That was decided in 1918 the first time. Do they have the briefs on that as far as those original rulings on the courts and like in 1918 and so on? Oh yeah, they're digging that out. Yeah. But that's all out of the literature I will. Yeah, right, right. They turned away with that. They took care of that. Um, the Supreme Court came out at that time against the city of San Diego. Right. That was, wasn't that the uh, Spreckles? Uh, Spreckles sure. against the U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. Navy came in. And the city of San Diego, then a small little city with 15,000 population, turned around by public uh, rights, or what they call it? Public domain. Public domain condemned their best well. Mm -hmm. But it happened to be one of the deeply seeded wells, which after nine test wells were drilled around, either dry or wet, uh, different water uh, altogether. Do you remember, uh, was there any information how they located that original well down there? No. Just, I suppose, a little bit true. I don't yeah. know. Just maybe hidden, miss idea. Right. See, why don't we, uh, let's go back, uh, uh, just for a little uh, continuity, why don't we go back to the, uh, after you had gone on these camping trips back in Germany, yeah. and realized that there are other sources of water, and then you started talking basically about some of the experiences in, in the mines. <coughs> <Maybe. coughs> well, talk about I never did swallow the idea of water as it was taught. Till I got into mining. Prior to that, in my studies in mineralogy for mining purposes, I began to realize that all the rock, all the metals, all the minerals are, sub are derived from the water. This is a water planet. The rock itself, all that, came from the interior in gaseous state. Well, gaseous would include, well, okay, gaseous, and that would include well, water and energy. No water came uh, came uh, after hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, helium, mm -hmm. carbon, and from there it spread into different compositions. Since we know that the atom itself has a life cycle and is const undergoing constant transmutations, we have the con we are convinced of that now. We also know that the whole damn thing begins 300 miles deep, not 30 miles or 20 miles deep, from the gaseous states. So consequently today, there is no more secret. It's well published in high science. The schools don't haven't taken it up yet. And I suppose it's much better for those idiots that have been teaching for the last 20 years and came out of school 50 years ago, it's better, does it, that they don't get involved in it. Uh, you know damn well that the original medicine had some good foundations, but the old-fashioned idea about medicine in your business and the handling of certain diseases didn't make sense. You know the same story. So. I have a tape out here, i got to dig it out, which is far more clear, far more thought out than what we are doing now, and I'll get it for you. Okay, good. I'll dig it out. Okay. i got a hundred tapes out there. I made 10 years, 15 years, 12 years ago, right. whatever. Right. Yeah. And you go through some more. Okay. Um, so, Steve, now... So with the ideas and the different concepts and theories and so on of uh, different water sources, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, some of the early experiences when you came here uh, to the United States from Germany and uh, early work in the mines and what sort of tipped you off as far as seeing... Knowing from the old country schooling 
that all the metals and the minerals we find in the ground have originated out of the water transmutation. Only water could have come in in the gaseous state, hydrogen and oxygen, and then helium, and from there carbon and on through. We know that for sure. Then I became to know, and of course I followed the metals and the minerals. And as I was getting samples, rock samples, different metals, different minerals, I found the compositions. One more hydrogen, one less, you know. And I could find out where the alteration and the transmutation of the silicons changed, that I had the different minerals. In other words, lead couldn't deposit in certain rocks. Copper couldn't deposit in other certain rocks. Based on, the, uh, based on the composition from the beginning. And there I was aware of the fact that we are always in a mineral state, leach. Then when I got in and started drifting tunnels, in a hard rock solid formation, two and three thousand feet solid rock over me, all of a sudden I hit a stream of water, solid rock. No sediment, no gravel. No and, and the stream would be like in a, in a like a, a fracture, pressure, just in a fraction. Yeah. You'd actually see the water flowing right. through it. Soon as I get into what is called a, a, sh a shear zone, right. shearing, uh -huh. I had the water, flowing water. Yeah, it came it to run us out. Many mines, the record show, 20, 25,000 gallons, right like that, running. Take the uh, Comstock. They'd set off a charge and, and get into the Put in a blast there, and then the next thing I know, I got the water. In one case, I know where we were drilling the holes for blasting, the water, just the one inch steel, shut out like a one inch faucet. Solid rock. See? So that'll wake you up. How the hell can that be possible? If it was surface water, that's nuts. The deep water, following the contact zone. Coming up. The yeah. And then when you study the mineral deposition, the shear zone, the oxidization point, then you find you're always on a contact. Mm -hmm. That might have been millions a year of past originally. See? Just a new one, a new, a new bedding plane came out. Uh, I was then convinced. And then I went and... Uh, and uh, transferred the opinion and the assurance that I had into the mining system where I needed water. And the first, the first one I drilled was in Nevada, out there, uh, 40 miles, 20 miles from Boulder there. Yeah. Dry country, they had to quit all the mining, no water. But then I ran and shoved the hole down 182 feet, 183 feet, and drowned out of the sand pitch. And now they're using it again for mining. In a bone dry country. And they don't have to pump it, she's overflow. The pipeline from the Wall Street mine is uh, what you call gravity flow. And they loaded the pipe originally with the water, and then when they open it up, she pulls it. And they're taking 400 gallons a minute for the mine. Around the clock. Now that, that well was, you, you dug that as an open open well, didn't you? I had to. I wanted to, first I intended I get a drillery. Then Herbert Junior, Herbert Hoover Junior said, Steve, don't do it. If you miss it, then they'll run us both out of town. See? Tell the foreman to sink a shaft down for, for exploration of mining. Like if you're looking for ore. Right. That's when I was. And, and, um, and you basically got into one of the fractured areas. Well, I know I had to hit it from the geology I could read. Based on underground geology? Or no, on geology? the hillside. Just by looking and yeah. seeing where the pulse um, came to the right, surface. Right, and get the bearings on it. Uh -huh. And the dip. Strike and dip. Right. And you had mineralogy by that time, too. Oh, natural. So, that was simple. And when I hit that water, it came in so goddamn far. It was bone dry all the way down till we hit it. And then it ran him out of the hole. What did uh, Herbert Hoover Jr. think about that? Oh, 
he thought I was right, so did his father. He was the first man to encourage me. They paid me for just about 18 months my salary to study all the mines I could find that flooded out in Colorado, in, in Canada, in California, Arizona. To study the geology of the mines? In Mexico. To study, to find a leader. What is the surest way of approach to drill one or where? So he, he saw it. Cooper told me, he said, in the driest goddamn desert in, in uh, Australia, no water for 200 miles around, we hit mines that flooded us. Yeah. So he knew the concept. And he he knew the concept. The he understood it. So he said, you go out and collect the information so you got something to go by. Compare them all. And I went to Mexico to those mines that flooded out. Most of the big Mexican mines are flooded, you know. Most of the silver mines there, they're just shut down because of the water. And we had quite a few of them in Colorado, of course, flooded out. The tombstone in Arizona is a perfect example. They're all flooded. And Five Star spent about $10 million trying to pump them dry, and the more they pump the more water they got. <laughs> It doesn't seem like that. You'd think they'd be, they could just sell the water in Arizona. Well, Tombstone is well known for that. That's one of them. Then we had a bunch of them up here. Then, of course, the big one was the Comstock. And they thought <coughs> all they had to do is drill that tunnel, nine mile tunnel. Mm -hmm. To drain it? Yeah. They drained it out all right. Then they wanted to fill the ore and they washed out again. The only trouble was the water was hot and sulfur. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't potable water? No, no, no. They couldn't work in it, too much gas and sulfur. They just quit going down at 2,200 feet. Steve, what would differentiate then between that kind of hot, sulfurous, um, non-drinkable water and, uh, you know, drinkable water, and how do you know where you're going to get what? Whatever the minerals are in the water, in the rock. In the rock. See, if they are in the rock, they are in as oxides above. Mm -hmm. When there was maybe a higher water level in, to begin with or something. Mm -hmm. But you can analyze your rock damn well and know damn well you got good water coming up. No question of that. Uh, I got a tape that's much more satisfactory. That's been well thought out and, and uh, step for step. Right. I'll dig it out and get you make a copy or two. But we are in business, don't you worry. Uh, the, the pipelines are dry, they listen. They, they watch my closely. But all these boys in the water business from Sacramento down are just baffled. Well, it's not the first time they've been baffled, Steve. You know, you've baffled them a few other times. Well, of course, we knocked them out by drilling on that mountain there on the reservoir. <laughs> yes, it's a little, uh, a little bit disconcerting, I'm sure. It is very disconcerting. To them, not, not to Myers or you, obviously. No, Myers just realized after he got to talk to me and watched it and he investigated a bunch of words I had drilled. He said, we are going in business. There's more money in water than there is in land or in farming or in anything. There is a warehouse there that you always have to have the inventory, and you don't have to go out and buy inventory and sell it. It's always there. Speaking of, of you know, just water in general, you know, and thinking about some of the problems that we currently are facing with uh, food supply in various parts of the world, and based on the experience you've had in Israel, in Egypt, and mm -hmm. Sudan, and so yeah. on, uh, is there any doubt in your mind about the availability and the possibility of developing good water sources, say in places like Ethiopia there. Well, sure. Uh, in That's what that Englishman, I didn't tell you that fellow is here from London. You mentioned him. Well, he's going to be here in another day or two again to talk to me with a writer. There is a, he had with him a writer of what they call in England a scientific journal like. Right. He wants to get to listen and talk to me about it, and I'm very cautious. All I do is give him a few tapes and discuss it with him here. Because when you talk those things with a writer, he generally gets it fouled up. He, he, he doesn't quote it or quote you right. 
he gets part of the facts, but yeah. they're out of line or out of yeah. order. And, and that can hurt. That can hurt. Then somebody with a little understanding of geology or mineralogy said, oh, that is what, that's humble. Right. And he arms you instead of good, do you good. But there's no doubt as far as you're concerned that uh, those kind of water sources can be developed. Well, how the hell I've told though, dozens of them, yeah. not supposed to exist. Under all the rules and regulations, like they are teaching today, these old timers, couldn't be possible. Oh no, it's impossible. But then you tell him, how about that spring running year round uniformly? The rainwaters never go run uphill, no drainage into it. And the biggest springs are eight and nine thousand feet elevation. Whether you go to Bolivia, though, to wherever you go, or Asia, or the Himalayas, or mm -hmm. the rovers up on the highest points are the biggest spring mm -hmm. in lakes. Mm -hmm. And generally above the snow line. I mean, nature has provided us all the facilities to think, but we just refuse to do so. Or observe. Yeah. And uh, one of the problems, of course, is we have certain ideas about the way things work. And we're preconceived conclusion. Oh, yeah, preconceived. Let somebody said something at the early stages, and everybody fell on it. The most logical. What do you attribute the? Uh, you know, your your training was at the Naval Academy yeah. in Germany. Yeah. When, uh, we had a better training. We were given a chance to express ourselves. Question. Here, you, you get dumped. We learn a certain amount to be able to pass an examination. And right. You know, right. Agree with, with everything they say. And they let you express yourself. And I say it's better. Whenever we made a mistake and spit it out wrong, everybody laughed at us, and so does why. Here we hold it secret if you're wrong yeah. in science. Mm -hmm. Don't admit it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, obviously you had people back in those days who, uh, you know, that had an extensive knowledge of isotope geology also. That are in well, those days more to some, some of our best geologists best like Schuess and two or three other top men the last hundred years came out with my idea, talking about it, mm -hmm. expressing their op opinion and correctly. Yeah. And right now with this damn Nobel Prize business, they said that many of them have agreed with them, are agreeing with me, but <laughs> none of them produced the goods. I'm the only one that drilled them. So there we are. There is no bigger investment today than the acquisition of the type of water like Meyer is at. Because they are not dependent on rainfall or precipitation. Yeah, to be able to prove that will be, you know, be able to scientifically show and document that it's a separate source from the groundwater. It's well, very beneficial. Any of those beds that he bought now, the six of them, the analysis of the water proofs. The tritium test alone does. There is no possibility of any deep seated water having tritium content. See? And you don't find any surface waters that hasn't. Because the northern lights, the heavy lightning, are creating the energy 50 million volts to create the tritium, hooking three atoms together. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the, Dr. Lippe's accomplishment. Right. The, the, the uh, water gets into the, hyper, the hydrological cycle. Then right. You determine the There's no way of missing it, but you cannot find it in the interior of the Earth. Could you uh, tell me again, you had described to me once before about the fact that uh, rock, uh, minerals, or maybe let's call it um, uh, any of 
the any of the rock formations are basically um, ash. You yeah. call it in terms of ash compared right. to what it was at one time. From a fluid to ash. Fluid to ash, and basically the then water. Then the crystallization. And the crystallization is a slow, slow process. But as the crystallization occurs, say let, let's take it from the magma condition. All right. This is cooling. As it cools, you have the rock formation. Right. But in the process of the rock formation, you then basically have the water. You get the helium and, the, and eventually the carbon. And, <coughs> and by that process, then where would the water come in? As the rock crystallizes, the water is at the residual of the crystallization yeah. process. Or rather, the crystallization is secondary is the residual of the water process itself from the gaseous hydrogen state. Yeah. You start with one, you go to two, from two you go on, the whole ladder. And then uh, once you have the water, the hydrogen present, you get the helium and the carbon. Right, right. And as soon as oxygen comes along. And you get solidification. You don't start with any solid matter. Right. But, but in the cooling process, then... This Gradually it develops, yeah. The, that's where the formations come. The atomic rearrangements come in. And the alteration, metamorphosis, and uh, what they call it, uh, transmutation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea of volcanoes producing like 98, you know, all of the material that comes in volcanic eruption right. like 98 percent water, which is pretty sure, well accepted sure. today. Was that a concept that was current when you were in your training? No, we, we were told that an enormous amount is water. Uh -huh. But they didn't really have the ability, I guess. No, analyze. they didn't know the full, the full, but they did know that because of the volcanoes forming the clouds right. 50, 100 miles away and the rains. Yeah. They sort of deducted that. They deducted that. Volcanoes is the only salvation this planet has to continue. Hope it does, mm -hmm. or we'll get we'll get stung. That large production of water is due to volcanoes. Mm -hmm. Billions and billions of cubic feet. Yeah. Uh, you take that volcano up in Oregon, boy, he's. Uh, I mean, they have really water production. Mm -hmm. No matter if the Oregonians get most of it or whoever it gets. Well, Hawaii too. There again, you get right back to the center of the earth. Everything starts with the heat. Yeah.